Hello and welcome. I'm Esther Allen, a professor at City University of New York, and I'm here with Allison Markin Powell, who translates Japanese literature, works with the Penn Translation Committee, and has been a driving force co-organizing Translating the Future, which is the conference that you're now attending. In the past weeks, we've seen in horror how massive global protests against atrocities perpetrated upon the black community in the United States by the police seem only to have exacerbated that brutality. This has been a moment of awakening and a time for education. One valuable resource is the Black Liberation Reading List published by the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture at the New York Public Library. On that list is Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, Intimate Histories of Social Upheaval, an extraordinary book by Sadia Hartman, who, among other things, is a former fellow at the New York Public Library's Kalman Center for Scholars and Writers. Hartman has just had a piece in Bomb Magazine titled The End of White Supremacy, An American Romance. And I strongly recommend that you read her book and her latest article in their entirety. I'll quote one passage from the article. When the pandemic overtakes the city, they will die in greater numbers. They will suffer more. When the mob arrives, they will be as courageous as Mary Turner and call out the names of their killers. They will not yield. They will not be moved. In this other variant, the question is no less pressing. How is love possible for those dispossessed of the future and living under the threat of death? Is love a synonym for abolition? Thank you, Esther. And thank you all for joining us for this, the sixth installment of our weekly series, Translating Plays and Playing with Translation, featuring two enormously talented people, Aya Ogawa and Jeremy Tiang. Aya is a Tokyo-born, Brooklyn-based playwright, director, performer, and translator, whose work reflects an international viewpoint and utilizes the stage as a space for exploring cultural identity, displacement, and other facets of the immigrant experience. Jeremy is a translator, playwright, and novelist, originally from Singapore and now based in Queens. You can read their full bios on the Center for the Humanities website. This series of weekly one hour conversations is the form that Translating the Future will continue to take throughout the summer and into the fall. During the conference's originally planned dates in late September, several larger scale events will happen. We'll be here every Tuesday until then with conversations about the past, present and future of literary translation and its place in the world we find ourselves. Please join us next Tuesday at 1.30 for the first of a mini series within our program titled Motherless Tongues, Multiple Belongings. The first of these conversations will be between Jeffrey Angles and Monica de la Torre, inspired and moderated by Bruna Dantas Lobato, which will explore linguistic multiplicities in their writing and in their translation. Please check the Center for the Humanities site for future events. Translating the Future is convened by PEN America's Translation Committee, which advocates on behalf of literary translators, working to foster a wider understanding of their art and offering professional resources for translators, publishers, critics, bloggers, and others with an interest in international literature. The committee is currently co-chaired by Lynn miller Lockman and Larissa Kaiser. For more information, look for translation resources at PEN.org. Today's conversation will be followed by a Q&A. Please email your questions for Aya Ogawa and Jeremy Chang to translatingthefuture2020 at gmail.com. We'll keep questions anonymous unless you note in your email that you would like us to read your name. And if you know anyone who was unable to join us for the live stream, our recording will be available afterward on the HowlRound and Center for the Humanities site. Before we turn things over to Aya and Jeremy, We'd like once again to offer our sincere gratitude to our partners at the Center for the Humanities at the CUNY Graduate Center, the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, the Kalman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, and PEN America. And now over to you, Jeremy and Aya. Hi, 
Hi. Hey. <laughs> How are you, Jeremy? Uh, surviving the present moment like us all. How are you doing? Same, same. Surviving, keeping people alive in the house. But it's lovely to connect with you like this, even though we're not in the same room. Yes, likewise. So um, I just want to kick things off. Jeremy, I mean, I've known you for years, really. Um, we haven't been super close until now, I would say. Um, but I've known you to be uh, both a playwright and a translator and many other things. And I'm just curious how you arrived at where you are in your career as a translator and a playwright. I guess like all the best things, I sort of stumbled into it. Um, I, I grew up in Singapore, um, which as you probably know, is a very multilingual place. Um, so I grew up bilingual, speaking English and Chinese and also being surrounded by other languages. Um, then I went to the UK to train as an actor and sort of fell from acting into playwriting. Um, and at a certain point realized that translation was a way to make sense of all the different languages and cultures and identities um, swirling around inside myself. Um, so now I sort of balance my own writing with my translation work and I see them as part of the same body of work as a kind of spectrum rather than two distinct things um, and as equally important to me. And what was your first translating gig or like how did you how did you start translating um, work? Well like like many um, novice translators I set my sights impossibly high uh, so the first thing I tried to translate uh, was a play by Gao Xingxian, because um, why not start with a Nobel winning playwright? Um, <laughs> so I found his email, I can't remember who gave it to me, but someone gave me his email and I emailed him saying, Gao Xingxian, may I translate your play? Um, I want to, and I stand by this actually, I wanted to translate it for performance because the existing translations of his work um, were done in a more academic way that I don't think would work as well on stage. And in fact, Gao Xingjin is very little performed in the English speaking world. Um, and he phoned me. Like, I do not know why I included my phone number in the email, never do that. Um, but Nobel Award winner Gao Xingjin phoned me and said, that's already a translation of my work. And it was this very polite Chinese thing. And he's like, so it's not very nice for there to be another translation. Um, and I didn't really have the vocabulary at the time to talk about different interpretations. And also like, you know, I had no actual body of work to back me up. So I was like, thank you, Gao Xingxia. And I like to think that was an auspicious start to the whole thing. Cause, you know, starting my career from a point of humility um, has, I think, kept me aware of um, the, the need to, I guess, bring others into the conversation and sort of think more holistically about what I'm doing in this whole mm. ecosystem, um, which at that point was not translate the work of a Nobel Prize winner. Um, and then a little after that, I approached a Singaporean playwright who had actually been my teacher in high school and said, may I translate your plays? And he said, yes. And uh, my translation was performed in Singapore. Um, and I was like, oh, this worked. I'll do more of it. And mm. here we are. So yeah, kind of a convoluted way in, but we find our own way to where we need to be. Mm. Um, how about you, Aya? What was your path into writing and translation? It's so funny. I, I'm finding a lot of resonance with your story. Um, I was born in Japan and we moved back and forth quite a bit between Japan and the US. Um, and that kind of uh, gave me a pretty mm, like disjointed childhood. It wasn't an unhappy one, but um, when I did 
land in California for middle school and high school, I really felt like I didn't know, uh, I didn't know really where I was and I also didn't know who I was. And so I started acting in the high school drama program. And that was actually a place where I finally felt like, oh, I could be here. I could live here. I can be myself here. Um, and so my entry into the theater world was through acting and I thought I wanted to be an actor. Um, I came to New York, I went to Columbia and um, I did study some playwriting there and directing, but I, I really thought that, you know, I was meant for the stage. <laughs> Um, but quickly also realized this was in the early, I uh, mid nineties, uh, mid to late nineties when I graduated that, um, you know, the field did not have a lot of work for me or someone like me. Um, and it was very humbling and extremely frustrating, um, to be in this kind of powerless position of, of the professional acting life, having to be somebody else that is not, that I have no control over, you know? Um, so I started more and more focusing on writing. I was working with a company that was very collaborative and we would kind of devise our own work. And from there, after I left, I really primarily focused on writing and also directing simply because, um, I didn't think anybody else would be interested enough in my work to direct it. So I just started doing that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, the translation bit, it's funny. Um, I had a day job working at the Japan society for a very long time and uh, they bring artists from Japan to perform in New York and all over the U S and oftentimes these pieces, whether they were traditional no plays or contemporary uh, theater pieces, they would have no translation. And being the kind of bilingual person that I am um, in the department, mm -hmm. I would often be tasked to translate or create subtitles for these shows. And so that's how I, that's how I stumbled into it because it was part of my day job. And I kind of, for a really long time, um, didn't want to be, didn't want my translator identity to be the thing that people knew me for. Um, because, you know, 10 years ago, I would say, there was really still a sense that the translator is, uh, is invisible, should be invisible, um, is like a filter rather than an entity mm -hmm themselves. Um, but now I've reached a point, I think, in both of my, my writing and my uh, translating work that I feel comfortable and, in fact, really embrace um, both aspects of my work and think that they really feed each other and um, nurture each other. Do you find it that way? I mean, do, how, do, how does your translation work and your playwriting work collide or coexist? I think first and foremost, by um, expanding my sensibility, um, because translation pushes me into all kinds of areas that I might not um, enter into on my own. Um, just because you're engaging with someone who lives elsewhere and works within a different theatrical culture. Um, and that pushes you to explore that and what they're doing. And I find it gives me a whole new vocabulary. Um, translating plays from Singapore and Taiwan and Hong Kong and China um, has kind of shown me what's happening in these theatrical worlds, um, which are quite different also. Yeah. Um, and then I bring some of that into my own work. My own writing has become much more multilingual um, than it was. Um, and I use language, I think, in a way that is more fluid um, 
I, I think there can be a tendency in the English speaking world to use non English languages as a kind of seasoning, like, you know, here are a few non English words just to amp up flavor. But actually, um, translation has brought me to a place where I'm more fluid with language. And it's like, actually, this person would totally say the speech in Chinese or whatever. And let's just do that. Um, so I feel I've become more open, but um, I guess it's, it's chicken and egg. It's, it's my tendency to want to be more open that's brought me into translation and made me want to work in this realm. Um, yeah, I, I think this is something that I'll continue to explore and they'll continue to impinge on each other in different ways, but they definitely are part of my work that enrich each other and I wouldn't want to let either of them go. Do, do you find the same that um, your writing and translation feed each other? Yes, yes, they definitely do. And, and the way, yeah, I never really um, reflected too deeply on my deliberateness in using multiple languages in my own plays. Mm -hmm. But I think for me, it really came from wanting to challenge the idea of a monolithic white English speaking America mm -hmm. in the theater, you know? And saying, actually there's, uh, there's a whole world out there that I can begin to kind of show aspects of by bringing in other other languages. Um, but I, I, I have also found that, um, as you might know, I've translated a lot of Toshiki Okada's work and mm. I've not just dealt with his text, um, but have also translated, uh, like interpreted for him when he's like doing a workshop or during a rehearsal process or something, anything like that. And um, he, I've found that certain way, certain exercises that he's done or certain ways he has structured ideas in those exercises have subconsciously and directly affected the content of my plays. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and it's often like much later on that I realize that that's happened. I'm like, oh no, but it, it's not as if I'm, uh, you know, in any way imitating him or his writing style. Um, but I think because the process of translation is so intimate, I would say, yeah. Um, you're really entering into someone else's mind and trying as best as you can to see through their eyes that it, it cannot, I can't help but have that kind of leave some residual shadow on my own creative impulses. Do you find that too? Like more, more than just like a language like incorporating other languages thing do you think that other playwrights ideas have influenced your work in that way yeah definitely um i think as, as you say you can't spend that much time with someone and and not have some trace of them remain on you it's kind of imprinting um and i think that that can be really um because the relationship is so close it can be really fruitful, um, that sort of mind melt. Um, it's, it's a bit like the Borg, isn't it? Um, as a writer, um, everyone you've ever translated remains in you. And so by working with such a, because we both worked with quite a range of playwrights, um, I think the influences on us then um, become really rich and, and multiple. I, I'm intrigued about Okada specifically because he has such a distinctive style. Um, and is, is there an example that comes to my mind? Um, yeah, I mean, it, and this may sound so um, superficial, but um, so he has this exercise he does with his actors, um, or mm. I guess he has, has, he has used it to audition actors 
and he has used it in part of his rehearsal process. And it's a very simple exercise when one person stands up and describes the house that they are living in or their childhood home. They basically, one person describes a space and then the next actor has to come and describe the space, the same space, even though they've never had a direct relationship to that space. And for him, this exercise is not about one actor mimicking the other, but it's, he describes it as, um, you know, when we speak and move in the world in real life extemporaneously, we have an image behind, we have an image of something. And we are trying to communicate that image using text and movement. And so text and movement are at a sibling relationship to each other, not a hierarchical relationship to each other. But when we're acting on stage, actors have to memorize their lines, right? Um, and, and their movement. And the movement tends to become uh, like in a, the, a child a child relationship to the text so the text overrides the movement so in his work he's trying to um deconstruct that that mm -hmm. artifice of the theater but that's not what has influenced me it's just this very simple exercise of describing a house and that because i saw that so many i, I probably have seen like 30 or 50 people do this exercise of describing their, their home. And it just, for me, I was working on a play called Ludic Proxy, which you've mm -hmm. seen. Um, and it, it was about, the first act is about a woman who um, lived in Pripyat, which is a, a town that housed the workers of Chernobyl and had to evacuate after the nuclear disaster and was never able to come back. And in the play, she's trapped somewhat in, in this kind of feeling of nostalgia for her childhood home. And she just endlessly in her mind revisits and revisits her home and describes it. So um, it, it's very much like a, a weird shape or structure to borrow, um, but it definitely came from him, I have to say. Mm. Yeah, no, that that play immediately sprang to mind um, mm -hmm. when you were describing the play's exercise, because that is so vivid, isn't it? The, the whole idea of trying to recapture a place that you've lost and can no longer go back to mm -hmm. and then rediscovering it, but it's not the same, right. um, which is, as I say, this occurs to me, it's also a metaphor for translation. Um, so it sounds like you've worked really closely with Okada um, are you generally very collaborative in your writing and translation? Um, yeah, well, I guess as I was describing the, my translation process, it's it's very intimate and it is very, uh, I guess, isolated. Um, I'm I'm lucky if I have some editors or proofreaders to work with me, but usually mm -hmm. it's just really me dealing with the text and dealing with the playwright. But with my own writing, I find that I depend heavily on collaborators, um, my actors and also my designers. And those conversations really have, are, are just essential to me being able to create my work. Um, I'm, I actually always um, feel a little bit shy when I say I'm a playwright because I um, I feel like the playwright as known to the world is someone who like actually sits at a computer and writes a lot of text and like shows up with a complete script. And I like to show up with nothing at all and kind of play in the room with people before I start writing. Um, so yeah, that kind of collaboration has been essential for my for my own work. And I imagine what the process must be like for you. I mean, I read part of your salesman play, which is almost entirely in Chinese. Hmm. Um, and I know you're working with a director who is, who is not you, who's not Chinese 
culturally, but who has spent a lot of time there. I mean, what is the, is there a lot of rewriting that happened in the development process of that play with the director or how did, how did that text come about? Oh yeah, I mean, we've done quite a lot of workshopping, um, but also because this play um, takes as its starting point, the production of Death of a Salesman in Beijing in 1982, which Arthur Miller himself directed, um, despite not speaking Chinese. Um, it and already this actually ha happened? This actually fact, happened. Yeah, uh, in fact, you can watch the entire production on YouTube. Um, and really good. It's, That's crazy. That is amazing. Um, and also the translator of the text, uh, Ying Ruocheng, played Willie Lohman. Um, so it, uh, the, the director, Michael Liebenluft, came to me um, and said, I've got an idea for a project. We should take this production that happened in Beijing in 1982 and do something with it. Um, and we started in 2017, um, and initially it was more of a recreation of the production and seeing what came out of that. And then we kind of realized that it was an opportunity to explore a lot of things that we'd both been interested in, because we both work um, bilingually and biculturally and also come from different directions because Michael's American, um, but went to Shanghai to study theater, uh, study directing. And I grew up in Asia and then came to the UK and then to New York where I am now. Um, so we kind of both had this experience of working in a different place and seeing how the stories we wanted to tell took a different shape when you transpose them. Um, and as a translator, that's something that really resonated with me. This idea of this play about the American dream, what happens when you take it out of America and do it with actors um, who've never really had any contact because China in 1982 was just out of the Cultural Revolution. They'd had very little contact with the West and a lot of the tropes of the play were unknown to them. And the play itself was not the monolithic work that it would be in New York in the States, I should say. So um, all of that, um, I've actually forgotten where we started, but I'm just gonna keep going. Yes, uh, no. This um, became a site on which um, we and the many actors we've worked with um, and the larger creative team um, all brought our, um, I guess, cultural fluidity. Um, Cause apart from the actor playing Arthur Miller, the entire cast, was bilingual um, and quite a lot of the creative team as well. So being in the workshops and then the rehearsal room was just this amazing experience of just moving between languages, um, translating for the people who didn't speak Chinese, uh, but mostly we just went and it really took a life of its own. And I would emerge from each session this wealth of material that I had to kind of bring into a shape and, and find a coherent form for. Um, so we were destabilizing the story in all kinds of ways. Um, it's being performed by an all-female cast um, just because, um, because I, I quite like the idea of a woman playing Arthur Miller um, that has actually already um, discombobulated some people. Um, yeah, we had some strange emails. So, so um, wait, but yeah. So, so that process, it sounds like it was really kind of a devised, devising um, process or- It or... was, and I think it's not a true devising process in that I did start with a text. Um, so rather than going in with a blank page, I kind of start with a text, bring it into the workshop and in the course of the workshop, completely rewrite the text. Um, but not necessarily taking what the actors have said verbatim, but sort of going, oh, you did this, I'm going to take that it there instead. I, I guess that is a form of devising. Um, it's, it's hard to pin down. Um, for sure, I couldn't do it without the collaboration of um, the entire team. Um, and then the text so, yeah, that I, you brought into the room, was it actually in Chinese when you brought it into the yeah. room? Uh-huh, got it. Yeah, no, I, I think that is a presumption that I write in English and then trans self-translate into Chinese. But actually, when I'm writing in Chinese, I become a different person mm. um, than I am in English. Um, 
And also, I, I, I think a lot of things just aren't possible. Like trying to imagine what these people in Beijing would be saying in English and then translating it wouldn't work for me. You, you kind of enter into their world completely and they're speaking yeah. Chinese. Just try to transcribe that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense mm. to me. Ludic Proxy also contained a lot of languages, which I was excited about, because um, that was Japanese and Russian, if I yes. remember right. Yeah. Yeah, I, you, yeah. I was going to say, do you speak Russian at all? No, or? I don't. I don't speak Russian at all. And so I worked with a, a translator, um, mm -hmm. dramaturg who who helped me. And also in the development of that piece, which spanned about five years, <laughs> because uh, you know the play company they were so generous and they they commissioned me to create a play and they said you can make it about whatever you want. And I was like, great. Um, and as soon as I started writing or, or thinking about what to write, um, some big life events happened, um, including the earthquake in Japan um, in 2011 and quickly followed by the death of my mother, um, then followed by the birth of my second son. Um, so I, kind of had to process all of this as I was creating this play and all these things um, I'm sure you will recognize have made themselves, work themselves into the, into the play. Um, but yeah, the, for that, the Russian section, I had um, a, a Ukrainian woman who was part of the workshop who uh, was very generous and giving me a lot of feedback. And I also worked with a translator who at the end kind of cleaned everything up and also came in as a speech coach. Um, and the conceit being because it, the Russian section of this play was, is the memory of this woman and she's casting the people in her American life into characters in her memory, it was okay for them not to be actually Russian or Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. Whereas in act two, which takes place in Japan after the uh, earthquake, and it was about the present moment and it was about the audience exercising their agency and actually exerting their, uh, their ability to take action in the moment by uh, choosing what one of the Japanese protagonists says and does uh, like a mm -hmm. live video game through the course of the act, that was all conceived in Japanese and um, also developed with two Japanese actors and who, were, who helped immeasurably in creating this like crazy branching narrative. Mm. Um, but it's funny while I was working on the Japanese, uh, I was writing in Japanese, but I was also already thinking about the subtitles. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and being very conscious of what kinds of things were not translatable or, um, deliberately omitted in the translation to keep the subtitles tight, you know, and, mm. and yeah. So even though you wrote that entire section in Japanese for the American audience, most of them would experience it through the subtitles. Exactly. Did you put in any bits that were just for Japanese speakers? I, I can't remember if there was any kind of special treat like mm -hmm. that. Um, but do you think they would have had a different experience of that scene? Absolutely. Than, yeah. Absolutely. And that was really a learning lesson for me too, because the reaction that I got from Japanese audiences was just so different from, from non-Japanese audiences. And um, I mean, it's hard to kind of encapsulate right now, mm -hmm. but you know, my intention in wanting to place the audience in that spot of giving the audience the power to choose mm 
mm. what the character does and says. Um, I think that um, that decision in terms of the theater form was received very differently from uh, the Japanese audience and the non-Japanese audience. Because for, I think for Japanese people, it was very, those decisions were very real and yeah. high stakes, you know, and, and it was a bit more of a reach, I think, for the non-Japanese audience. I mean, it, it, you know, I think my plays are always kind of a litmus test in that way. Uh, mm -hmm. It kind of, it kind of lays bare like where the audience is at. I had another play that was, uh, that was about translation. Um, and there was a scene with Spanish speaking people and English only speaking people. And it was really about how they were unable to communicate, but that mm -hmm. immediately divided the audience, right? Between the people who can understand Spanish and those who can't understand Spanish. And so there was a, a divide <laughs> that yeah. occurred that was, that was fun. I think it really like brought the audience alive and kind of aware of themselves and aware of like who else was in the sitting here in the theater with me, you know? Yeah, I mean, I like what you said about the litmus test because quite often I think with an audience, you tend to become part of this homogenous mass, right? You're kind mm. of in communion with the play. Um, and then when the play throws it back at you and goes, no, actually going to split you up or going to divide you up a bit. Um, and then you start to think about your own relationship to the people around you and how a lot of that is accomplished through language. Mm. Um, a, a moment ago, you said something about the things that were untranslatable for the surtitles. Um, which is always a fun concept, right? What is untranslatable? And in our own translation work, are there things that just don't make it across the divide? Yeah, it's... <laughs> I mean, the, the stupid examples are just about, you know, the clumsiness of, of, of translation and, and grappling with, like, well, I can say this thing in you know, three words in Japanese, but in English, it's going to take up to 12 words. So I've got to do something about that, you know. Um, but I think that what I bring to the table as a translator is my experience as a playwright and a theater maker. So I'm not just kind of dealing with the text and the author's intentions, but I'm also really grappling with um, like cultural translation, cultural context, um, finding equivalent cultural markers in order to make that jump really quick into another, to an American context. Um, also, you're completely at home in both cultures, um, I'd imagine. With well, <laughs> It's complicated. I mean, I don't know how you, well, I imagine, I've never been to Singapore, so I imagine that it's like everyone is kind of inhabiting multiple languages and ethnicities all the time mm. anyway, but, you know, Japan, Japan is still such a homogenous right. place and it's still very hierarchical and very kind of, you know, like if you're not Japanese, ethnically or by blood mm. like you're not really Japanese that kind of attitude and so I, I find it really stifling and mm. so it's not that I I feel like linguistically speaking yes I, I would be fine it's just my soul does not feel right at home in Japan yes mm. yeah I mean maybe I shouldn't have said at home but um I guess having full access to, mm. um, perhaps. I, I, I don't know, that, that's interesting though, because as someone who was born in Japan and is of Japanese heritage, where then do you position yourself as a translator? You know, yeah, you it, it takes some explaining. Um, <laughs> I actually, I'm, <laughs> I'm just realizing that one of the first things that I say to uh, Japanese people, especially Japanese 
um, playwrights who are thinking of working with me is that I'm not Japanese. <laughs> you know, like I, I might look Japanese, I might sound Japanese, I have a Japanese name, but but that in, in my heart, I'm probably not as Japanese as I present, you know, so yeah. that, that it's very important for me that they are aware of that gap, you know, and yeah. for me, I think that gap is what, um, what's exciting in a way that there's, there's room there, right? Um, which the, the room to make the translation possible yeah where do you feel at home these days um well cop-out answer but um i guess everywhere and nowhere like there's nowhere where i would say i feel completely at home mm. um but at the same time i guess i have gotten used enough to fluidity that i am able to make a home for myself wherever i am um, it also helps, I guess, that Singapore is so multiple in so many ways. Um, when I'm working with a playwright or a writer from China or Taiwan, it, it becomes this really shorthand to go, oh, I'm from Singapore, and be like, oh, okay, we get it. Oh, um, interesting. What is it that they get, do you think? Because it's not about uh, the language, right? It, it's partly, the, like, it's the idea that I will have grown up with familiarity with Chinese, mm -hmm. um, although some expressions they find odd because the language has evolved, mm. uh, but also with English as a primary language. Um, so it's that kind of in-betweenness that I think a lot of people in former colonies feel, um, where there are multiple layers of culture and you kind of have access to all of them, but also don't fully own any of them. And because Singapore kind of, um, you know, the Chinese were incomers to Singapore, um, it, it, after colonialism ended, or rather I should say after it stopped being a colony, it was not a straightforward, well, I mean, it's never a straightforward process of going back to the previous culture, but because we were also geographically removed. Um, and in my case, because I'm also mixed race, my dad is part Sri Lankan, there was a lot mm. of um, not really being able to go back to an existing culture and kind of existing in the state of limbo, um, where you have a bit of everything, but not all of anything. Mm. Which it, it turned out is a really good place to start translating from. Mm. So I, I think translation has become the only thing that really allows me to make use of all these parts of myself and all these places I've lived and all these influences on me. Um, and kind of synthesize them. Um, so like rather than the metaphor of translation as a bridge, I, I see it more as, as a crucible, like this thing that you bring all these things into and then come up with something else. Mm, that's really beautiful. It's, yeah, I, I'm really interested in people like us who are kind of um, multiple or hybrid. Um, who aren't, you know, entirely in one place, but kind of have offshoots. And the way translation is a way of making sense of that. Um, yeah, going, going back to a point earlier about um, the presumed invisibility of the translator and the way mm -hmm. translators have gained more prominence. Um, it, it's been, nagging at me that um, it's not actually every translator um, who is expected to be invisible. Mm. Um, and I'm thinking back to, you know, even 10, 20 years ago, the, with something like art by Yasmina Reza, Christopher Hampton was hyper prominent in the production of that. Um, and there are certain translators who are given the status of um, artistic creator Whereas for us, it's been more of a struggle. So I'm interested in, um, firstly, the power dynamics of that, but also um, whether our position as being in between has what that has done to where we stand vis-a-vis -vis translation and writing. Yeah, that's a really interesting point you bring up. Um, 
Oof. And I, I don't know, I guess partially for me, because I seem to have fallen into every part of my practice, like backwards, like, mm. you know, I didn't seek out translation as a, as a path, but it, I was kind of pushed onto it backwards and I was like, ah. Um, so there was always a part of me that was not, I don't know, I didn't feel comfortable fully owning it. And so that may have done, that may have played a part in my feeling and kind of um, not just like not, not whole in it. Um, or I don't know, maybe it's because I'm a woman. I don't know that maybe it's because I'm Asian. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, it, there's an endless kind of cycle of questions that can begin to unravel. Mm. Um, but I do feel like actually now, finally in the last few years, I've been feeling, I guess the reason I feel like I'm able to embrace my identity as a translate, as translating being part of my artistic identity is because that it actually um, requires a lot of responsibility. And I'm in a position of actually choosing who I work with, whose words do I translate, which playwrights do I want to introduce to an, an English speaking audience. And that process has been really exciting to me. Um, yeah, I mean, we're back to the theme of collaboration mm -hmm. um, and the way that it, it's really about forming a really close relationship with another writer and a text and bringing your own artistic energy to it. Right. And how are you, how do you work with trans, like with playwrights? Do you go and seek out writers to work with at, or how does it work for you? Um, at this point, it's about 50-50, um, both with my um, fiction and theatre translating work. Um, well, it's 50-50 with the fiction, um, with playwrights, Writing, I'm still seeking out more work and finding playwrights I want to collaborate with just because mm. translation, as you know, isn't as prevalent in the theatrical world. Mm. Um, but um, I've been quite lucky in that a lot of um, Taiwanese theatre particularly, um, the play scripts are just available online to download and it's quite easy to get hold of them. So I've been able to read through a lot and then reach out to the playwrights that I feel I want to have a collaboration mm. with. Um, and the other thing is that um, theatre culture is as interconnected anywhere as it is here. So once you know a few playwrights, you kind of have access to them all. And I found that when I find a playwright I want to work with, um, I often ask them, what are you, you know, interested in? Who are you talking to? Who's mm -hmm. exciting to you? And often those are the people that, that I also find exciting and interesting. Um, and so I branch out that way. Yeah. Is that, yeah, how? Yes, that's how it has worked for me too. Um, Toshiki Okada, he works with, um, I guess, are they a manager, managing company or, yeah, let's just say it's his, his manager. <laughs> it kind of works mm. differently there. Um, but they handle several other playwrights um, and they have introduced me to a lot of other playwrights who are really working outside of mm. like the traditional and conventional theater landscape. Um, I'm thinking of Yudai Kamisato, who um, he's Okinawan and, but raised in Peru and so mm. has this Japan, South America connection and a very international kind of point of view over yeah. history and colonization and, and Japan. And um, it's been really, fun to delve into his work. Um, and also Satoko Ichihara, who's a, a, a Japanese, uh, a female playwright whose work I find so 
transgressive and um, exciting. And I just can't wait for somebody to produce her work here because I think that it would actually really resonate with an American audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is that, oh, I think, I think we're probably running out of time. Is it time for questions? It, we have some questions. It's been like, it's so, I mean, you know, you, your, your conversation has been flowing so organically. It was hard to find a spot to jump in, but we did, um, we do want to get to some of the questions from, uh, from the audience and um, viewers. And is thank you so much. It's been really, really fascinating to hear. I love like the way it's sort of like a, a a therapy session where the the juiciest questions come at the very end you know <laughs> but um all right so we have a um a two-part question that came in uh it would be great to hear jeremy elaborate on how translating arthur miller moving him across the language border into chinese also translated into his engendering as a woman and the second part of that question is does the gendering have any parallel with the translation um, so I should make it clear that I have not translated Arthur Miller. Um, Arthur Miller's lines in this play are all in English. Um, in, and in a way that makes the presence of Arthur Miller starker in that everyone around Arthur Miller is speaking in Chinese. But I've actually leaned a lot on Ying Ruocheng's existing translation of Death of a Salesman, which was the one used in that production. And looking at the solutions he found to the lang Arthur Miller's language, bringing that into the Beijing dialect of 1982, um, was a fascinating exercise in and of itself. Um, I, I think in, indirectly though, the fact that the play transgresses linguistic borders made it easy to go, and they will all be played by women. So yeah, um, I guess once you go off piece in one way, it gives you license to do it in many others. We have another question, um, a more general one that I, I'm sure you'll both have a very vehement response to from Jonathan Cohen. Uh, he wonders what percent of plays produced each year in the US are translations? Hmm. <laughs> Do you have any idea? I have no official statistics at hand, but I would say 0.3. <laughs> I would say once you, zero three. Once you, you Ibsen and Strindberg. Oh I think, yeah, yeah. I mean, but but that's it, isn't it? Um, translations of living playwrights are yeah probably zero point zero three. Um, yeah, I, I I wish someone would do a count, but also I mean, that would be really depressing. <laughs> Um, well, it also goes to show how, at least in the theater world right now, we're really have been inward looking. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope that that can change. I mean, there are, are great um, theater companies like the play company that are trying to change that. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I just, I guess I would like to see an expansion of um, what stories we see told on American stages. And I think that's a broadening of an existing conversation about diversity, because I think great strides have been made in terms of representation and diversity, but those often stop short at the borders of this country. And I'd just like to see that pushed further so that all American stories are told, but also stories from elsewhere can come in and be told here through translation. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, a multi-part question, questions for each of you and for both of you. Um, for Jeremy, what do you see as the distinction between translation for performance and academic translation? Is it the inclusion of paratextual material or is it the style of the dialogue and Dita Scalia itself? Um, the second part of the question is, do you feel now that you have the vocabulary to explain to the first playwright you reached out to why to retranslation but didn't take away from previous translations? What would you say to them now? <laughs> um, I, I'm completely outside the academic world. Um, 
And I probably shouldn't have said academic. I would make a distinction between translation for publication, in which case the play is to be read, and translation for, for performance, in which case you have to think about the other artistic collaborators right. and what a director and actor would find most useful in the creation of their performance. Um, I have no imminent plans to reach out to Nobel Prize winning playwright Gao Xingjian to um, relitigate our conversation from 15 years ago. Um, but if I did, um, I, I would say, I would point out to him that in the English speaking world, there are like a billion versions of the cherry orchard. We seem to have a new one every three years. And why on earth shouldn't there be multiple versions of Gao Xingjian? Each new translation brings, is an opportunity for a different artist to bring the interpretation to the text and to create something that is rich and vibrant and is one interpretation of hopefully many. That reminds me of what we were talking about um, the other day, Jeremy, which is when I was asserting that there is no perfect translation or there's no complete translation that that idea is false um, in the same way that they're that as as the same way as the idea that the translator should be invisible is cannot mm -hmm. be true because yeah. it is inev inevitably as you say an interpretation through one artist hmm. here's another uh, really interesting question that came in is the u.s a good place to be a translator whose identity or home is part here, part there. Uh, feel free to define good in any way you feel appropriate. I, <laughs> maybe not. I think maybe good in the sense that because there is such a diverse population here, um, I'm, I'm trying to contextualize it as a translator, um, but I, I've definitely received a lot of, of work, translation work being here, uh, I think more so than I would receive if I were living in Japan. Um, and there, there, because it's, it's so diverse and international here in New York, um, there are so many resources for, mm -hmm. For people who are who are translating, um, and by that I mean, you know, in my case, like other Japanese people who I can bounce ideas off of, other cultural institutions, and um, you know, universities that have kind of the research materials that I might need, and things like that. Yeah, I think in terms of infrastructure, um, living in New York, there's, there are so many resources and also so many places to draw inspiration from um, that it's good in that sense but as, as we've talked about the monolithic nature of um, American theatre and how hard it can be to find a foothold in it and to bring something different into it um, that's more of a challenge. Mm. Alison, do you have another question? Yeah, there's another, what's another part of one of the earlier um, questions. Um, this one was for you both. Do you feel when translating or writing a play that you are directing the show? Or do you feel that by interpreting a theatrical text, you are contributing something to the play's eventual mise-en-scene with the choices that you have made? I don't feel that way um but i think it's it is a tricky question i'm thinking particularly of my translations of toshiki okada's work toshiki is um, a playwright obviously but he also directs his own work with his company in japan um, so in japan it's very hard to divorce his scripts from his direction mm. but he is very open to uh, in in having his work translated into English he has no um, kind of hang-ups about how that text is eventually staged in America he he's actually 
I think, excited by the idea of other people interpreting and directing his work in ways that he couldn't have imagined. Um, so I do always feel that in order to get inside the text and inside his point of view, it's very helpful to understand how he directed it and how he, how his audience received his work. Um, it helps me create a context for the American audience to receive the translated work in a similar and perhaps like parallel way. But I don't think that it is really um, dictates anything about the staging or the direction itself. Mm -hmm. Also, Aya, you, you, you are a director. So <laughs> I, I think, does that bring an awareness of what, di what the direction of a piece would require in, in your work? Like, do you ever have the idea of, if I directed this, this is what I'd do? It's so funny. I, in terms of my translations, like I have no desire to direct them because mm -hmm. I've already had such a personal relationship to them. I think it might be, th that's where my breaking point is in the same way when I asked you if you would ever direct your own work, you were like, no, I need my other people. Yeah, that's where I would draw the line. Yeah, I realized um, at some point that I, don't really use stage directions even in my own mm. writing. It's like, you know, you decide. Mm. Um, I, I like the collaborative nature of it, of just being able to hand it on to someone else um, to have their go at interpreting. So I think we've run out of time. That ha what a wonderful conversation. I learned so much from both of you. It was such a pleasure to listen to you talk. And um, I wish you could go on for another, another long while. But uh, yes, we're out of time. Thank you both so much, Aya and Jeremy. And once again, we'd like to thank our partners, PEN America, the Center for the Humanities at the Graduate Center, CUNY, the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, and the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And we hope to see you again next week. Thank you. Bye. Bye.